does history support affirmative action? Uh, here on History is here to help. We're talking about history. If we're talking about history, we're talking to Dr. Peter Hoffenberg, a history professor at UH Manoa. And we're going to talk about affirmative action because it's all through higher education and even you know lower education uh, with these affirmative action programs that were adopted by many schools years ago and are now uh, in question uh, within the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, which is uh, inexcusably um, uh, uh, conservative, uh, or worse, mm, uh, seemed to indicate at the oral argument two weeks ago that they favored um, striking affirmative action programs. And, and that is probably a good indicator. They probably will strike affirmative action programs. And we should talk about you know, what that means to us. I think too many people say, oh, oh they're striking affirmative action. Uh, me, no, me no care. Um, but we do care. Um, or do we, Peter? What is the history of affirmative action? Where does it fit in our educational, um, you know, approach? Sure. Uh, first of all, I think you're right. Uh, the best that affirmative, could act, affirmative action could hope for is five to four, with Roberts sort of covering himself. But quite clearly, if you look at, if you read, uh, you know, not just the comments, but also the questions, uh, I think affirmative action as we know it is is dead at, at the university level. And it's a Trojan horse for it to be dead at other levels as well. I mean, the individual who brought the suit also brought the suit in uh, Shelby v. Holder, which dismantled and gutted the key uh, aspect of the Voting Rights Act. So, yeah, this is this is a Trojan horse. Uh, uh, where what is the history? Well, uh, there's a history that's international. There's a history that's American. But I think the the key sort of hit points are there regardless. Um, abortion as either preventing fertilization or preventing the birth of a child is as old as, as humanity. So are you saying that there's a, a parallel process here historically between abortion and affirmative action? I personally think yes, in the sense of um, what we're talking about is what, what can the government or state do. So I do think there is that overlap, most certainly. It's once again an attack on the poor, an attack particularly disproportionately on people of color. Um, I think it's also an attack, as we've talked about before, and I apologize to our listeners, uh, one of the bricks of the great society. I mean, whether or not you liked affirmative action as a specific policy, I think most people agree with LBJ's famous speech that you can't talk about equality, if somebody comes to the race, and I'll paraphrase, an expensive Nikes, right, and a Bloomingdale suit, and the other person comes to the race dragging change from the past. That's just not a fair race. And that he launched affirmative action essentially with that analogy at Howard University. That may also be the case with abortion. Women who need to either prevent pregnancy or end a pregnancy in order to proceed with their lives, whether that means a job, whether it means mental health, whatever. Again, you're saying that there are rights greater than that. So I think particularly it comes to people who need to make these decisions in a really a, a life or death matter for them as well. And is it the right of the state to say you cannot make the decision at the same time that the court says it's okay to carry a weapon in public? It just seems to be filled with all of these uh, inconsistencies. You know, I, when, when, when I heard they were going to have oral argument, uh, when I heard they took the case, and there was a certain amount of press on this very point, mm -hmm. I thought they're, they're, they're never going to validate uh, affirmative action. Not this court. This court is way over um, conservative is an, an understatement of where they are. They're extreme. Uh, they're reactionary. Um, I thought to myself, there's no way they're going to validate affirmative action. They're going to strike it. And then I thought, well, what, what is the really core issue. This is subjective, but mm -hmm. what, what is the really core issue uh, that, that makes me feel that they are going to do this? And it's what you were talking about. It's racism. It's creating a social divide. It's dumping on one group as opposed to another group. It's dividing the country on the basis of race, which is a hideous notion and really out of, you know, it's, it's, it's out of sorts. It's out of, it's out of time. Um, and um, I predicted that they would strike 
affirmative action from the first I heard that they were going to take this case. And now it's true. And I, I think we can, you know, intellectualize it and rationalize all the reasons they're going to come up with in the opinion we're going to see. But it comes down to that. It comes down to that, but also it's a perversion of that. Uh, you know, it's like uh, two of the, the uh, justices, associate justices saying, for example, you know, abortion is genocide against black people, for example. It's a it's a perversion of the race card. It's playing the race card to continue <laughs> racism rather than playing the race card to try to challenge it. Um, I think Powell and other justices put it well, and it's something maybe this country has difficulty doing. Um, you got to put the cards on the table. You have to address the problem, and then you can overcome the problem. Uh, in other words, you need to recognize racial inequality. You need to have public policies to address that. And then maybe, as John Roberts says, and uh, the justices have said, look, at maybe at some point affirmative action will not be needed. But it's certainly still needed. And all, this, all the statistics show that once this goes, uh, the number of, and we're, we're, remember, we're talking about particular ethnic or racial groups, right? We're talking about African-Americans, talking about Native Americans very much, right? The opportunity for Native Americans to go to off-reservation educational institutions has always been very limited. They've been sent, right? We know they've been sent to school, so I'm not including those in which their culture has bled out of them. And to a certain degree, um, the Latin community, or the Latin community you know, is so diverse, right? I mean, Cubans are not the same as Dominicans, et cetera. But it is an effort, particularly against those groups as racial ethnic groups. And the arguments, I think I agree with you, we shouldn't over-intellectualize, um, but as a public <laughs> figure and a professor, that's sort of what I'm paid to do. And I did- You I go did, right uh, ahead, Peter. And I apologize. But, 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 but <laughs> um, let me say, when, when they said in Dobbs uh, that you know the, the world has changed and we don't need Right. Uh, we don't need uh, Roe v. Wade anymore because the world has changed. I said to myself, that is the example of a Supreme Court that's gone over the edge and that is spouting poppycock. If that's what they if that's what they do here in affirmative action, um, we don't need affirmative action anymore. It's it's uh, it's, uh, it's 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 played its course. It's done. It's we have resolved these problems. So we don't need that those whole spate of laws uh, and rules. I, I say to myself, there it is again. It's poppycock. Right. I think it's poppycock, but for a different reason. I, I don't see, I mean, they keep citing uh, Justice O'Connor saying, you know, in 25 or 28 years, this won't be necessary. But they can't really say it's not necessary because when you still look at college admissions, uh, African Americans and uh, I guess the term is Latinx or Hispanic cultural people are still underrepresented. And Native Americans, you know, are less than a cent. So the argument has to be a little different. It's still poppycock, but it's it's slightly different. Um, and let me bore you for a couple of minutes to just tell you at least what I read and heard in the argument. One is that uh, affirmative action pits one race against another. And so we're again at that sort of my rights versus your rights argument, right? Like a right to walk safely across the street is less important than the right to carry a gun. And we've talked about almost every week how somehow we got to get out of this right, my rights versus your rights and understand there is a compelling public interest, right? And that's the scrutiny test was what got affirmative action approved. There is a compelling public interest. All right. So one of the ways to say that it isn't is that ironically affirmative action has promoted racial division. Okay. That's sort of one, one argument. Um, secondly, uh, there's the argument is not quite that it's no longer needed, but that it doesn't work. And it's really interesting, all of these graduates of elite universities, all of them, right? Almost all of them have gone to elite graduate uh, law schools, many elite undergraduate, you know, uh, uh, Brown is the only public defender. So I mean, we're talking about generally the powerful. They're critiquing their universities as being, as using affirmative action for increasing their elite status, which I find really, it's, it's like elites making a populist argument against an elite university. Okay. Uh, what they're doing also is ignoring uh, those out in the public who actually are 
gangbusters about affirmative action. The institution that's gangbusters about affirmative action is the armed forces. And the armed forces makes the argument <laughs> that the justices made when they approved it. Uh, we need to create leaders and we need people participating in social experiences which reflect the diversity of our society. And if we can only get that by affirmative action, then we're going to do it. And so we, they're, we they're different be a better threads. military. Well, they argue, we, ab, ab, not, and their argument actually is, is not just the better military, but I think also potentially uh, better veterans in society. I mean, you're seeing part of this problem with white extremists from the military. You know, they don't, they did not get the message, right? That you're supposed to train. We hope not go to war. So let's at least train. And if you have to go to war, go to war alongside people from cities and countryside, black, white, et cetera. And they, for some reason, didn't get that message. Um, and they're, an exa they're actually an example of our needing more affirmative action. Yes, yeah. you know, and you, yeah. you, you, you say that, and it reminds me of the whole notion of the greatest generation in mm -hmm. World War II. You had people in the hinterland, shoulder to shoulder, you know, uh, in the war, uh, meeting people, working with them, fighting with them, dying with them. Uh, from from the cities, so two completely different groups mm -hmm. that were that had been divided by geography right. up and to that's that still point. Still a big divide in our country, major divide in our country. Right, but urban, but if you, urban rural or urban non urban, yeah. But World War II and the Greatest Generation brought them together, and it was a very positive thing that they could meet each other and they could learn to trust each other and all that. Um, and so, uh, and that's affirmative action, I think, in its own way during World War II. Um, but now to, to strike it would, would, especially with an all-volunteer force, would, would revert back. Um, I, I, I can't, I, I, I agree with you. I'm not, I'm not quite, I haven't thought through exactly what would happen, but certainly, um, well, I think the Pentagon would push back. I don't think, I think the Pentagon would ignore it, you know, just as, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the, the um, head of the, the armed services, but Several, you know, congressmen went after him for being woke, et cetera. And all of the military brass have resisted that. They basically told the Congress members to go sit down. You know, woke has nothing to do with this, right? We want a diverse, qualified field, which represents, you know, what we hope would be a diverse, qualified uh, citizenship. So I think the other arguments um, are interesting on both sides, okay? Uh, among the other arguments uh, opposing affirmative action uh, is that somehow it violates the colorblind nature of the Constitution. And that goes back to Harlan, right, who said late 19th century that <clears throat> the Constitution is colorblind, to which uh, Associate Justice Brown made the very important argument that not only can you not find the word colorblind in the Constitution, okay, and you know how a lot of folks oppose abortion because they say you can't find the word, but she points to uh, the Civil War and post-Civil War amendments, which were clearly intended, right, to make reparations and to protect freedmen so they would not, not only not, you know, be rejected from white colleges, uh, but only go to historically black colleges. In other words, this could lead to more segregation, right? Qualified African-Americans will go more often to the historically black colleges, which is great for those colleges, right? There's, I'm not criticizing those as well, but what we are into is a separate and equal <laughs> higher education Absolutely right. environment in that way. And then um, in addition to the, the colorblind argument and her suggestion that uh, it was not... Uh, colorblind, uh, we continue to go back to this debate about the purpose of affirmative action. And I think we have to, as historians, you've asked me as a historian to talk about the history. So part of the history is there's always, always have been abortions. The idea after, uh, I'm sorry, affirmative, I apologize. Now we're, I'm getting mixed up. I apologize. Affirmative action. So let's get to the debate about affirmative action. I apologize. Affirmative action initially was promoted uh, as part of the reparations idea, that historically, there are certain groups, particularly African-Americans, 
who uh, the balance is just unfair and it has always been unfair, housing, employment, et cetera. If we believe the colleges are important for leadership, for knowledge, for socialization, then we should do our best to try to address that discrimination through affirmative action. And that was really the idea. And that was Johnson's idea, right? When the, when the Great Society is born and civil rights legislation comes through, it's the idea that in order for us to be equal at some point, we do have to make amends for the inequalities of the past. And I think for many people, that's a, still a compelling argument. And also the inequalities of the future. Right, right. To try to prevent. So the argument would be we address the inequalities of the past so that, as John Roberts you know, has said, without any evidence at all, you know, uh, let's get rid of racism by getting rid of racism. OK, fine. <laughs> you get rid of it when it doesn't exist. <laughs> right. Um, but what had happened, I shouldn't say but and what happened is that along the way and you know, the Bakke and Post's decisions are in part responsible for this. The idea of reparations got replaced by the idea of diversity. And so when it got replaced with the idea of diversity, you know, critics could make the argument that, for example, and you hear this uh, in the, the plaintiff's case at the Supreme Court, that wealthy sons of African businessmen are treated the same way as relatively poor great-grandchildren of Georgia sharecroppers, right? So their argument is in diversity is actually undermining reparations. That's one of their, their arguments. Um, and then- Perverse, that, perverse. Well, what it is is it enables in their mind certain people to take advantage of a category which was not really intended for them, right? So in 1964, when Johnson gets up, right? He's talking very specifically, right? About the- uh, descendants of sharecroppers and descendants of slaves who are still, you know, not allowed to be at the lunch table and are beaten up as they try to vote, that a college education is one of the ways to, to address that. Okay. I think in a way what they're also arguing besides the diversity uh, has replaced reparations is that diversity only according to race does not produce a diverse workplace or diverse educational experience. And the problem is that that is tilting at a windmill. There's no admissions officer, right, who says race is the only category. Nobody. Mm -hmm. So what's really an issue is can race be included? Can race be included in the holistic, as the Harvard guys say, holistic admissions process along with geography and uh, any number of things, sure. Uh, yeah. Class and you would is not expect an appropriate them word. to look at any number of things. Right. So I think the difficulty where Harvard got tripped up, and it's kind of its own fault, is the emails which said that race was not being used to add to the applicant's total number of points, but being used to reduce it. So in mm -hmm. other words, there some, were some emails that referred to uh, Asian personalities. Now, if that's the case, that is wrong. Absolutely wrong, um, just as there were quotas against Jews, et cetera. But that's, again, being used kind of as a wedge issue, all right? Um, that is a problem, and Harvard should address that. But does that mean the entire algorithm and calculus, which includes, you know, the, the grandson of a Pullman train <laughs> porter, all right? So, again, it's kind of a wedge issue, and you're a lawyer. You know how this works, right? You, you go for that little opening. But just that little opening, and you know the media says makes a big deal out of this, but re but without realizing, you know, there there are fifty different criteria on an admissions application. Um, the end result would be, though, as you said, that race cannot be included. If that's the if that's the result, the admissions committees will find other ways. Um, yeah, at the end is a subjective element in. In, in, in choosing who gets to go to school. Right. And, and as Associate uh, Justice Brown said, um, you can't dissect race out of an individual or community. You may decide it's not the most important thing, but there's plenty of numerical uh, correlation between race and wealth, for example. So if you turn to wealth, <laughs> okay, you also should end up with a, a significant number of African-Americans whose families, you know, have not been able to purchase a home. 
Uh, so I think her point was well taken. You know, you guys might, you might not like using race. And we, I think we know why they don't like using race. Okay. Um, and she would probably agree that race is not the only factor, but identities and not even using the, the clever use of identities now, just the way in which an individual integrates in society and integrates with others is so multifaceted, right? Ethnicity, religion, personal interests, size of family, where you, I mean, they're all factors that- On and on, that's an algorithm yeah. is what it is. Exactly, and it continues to change and grow. And I think her point is, you, you, if you take, if it's an algorithm or a molecule, you can't just take out the atom of race and say the molecule can function effectively. So one of the arguments has been, um, it's kind of the, uh, the go-to argument is to use class or wealth as a determinant. But again, how are you gonna separate that from race or ethnicity, et cetera? So it sounds good, right? David Brooks makes a big deal out of turning to class. But again, you can't, you can't separate out. What are you gonna do, family wealth? I mean, how would you even how would you even determine class? You know, what, one thing just uh, hearing you on this is it strikes me that if you took race out of the algorithm, it would be in anyway, right? It would still be there. I think that was that's Justice but, Brown's point, right? Right. But, but the problem that I see is something that preceded uh, uh, affirmative action, mm -hmm. and that is um, so. If you have a uh, somebody making the choice. Um, and they know that this individual is black, they might rule against him uh, or her. Very they, much. They, Very they much. Say, okay, we got, we got his number now. We don't want him in our school. And so what you have is a reversal hmm. of the Johnsonian principle um, in a de facto kind of way. And, that, and that's very problematic. And what, what, what right. affirmative action does is it says, you know, Yes, you can consider race, but as a positive, not as, you know what I mean? Not as a negative. Right. You're not going to use it to discriminate so exactly. negatively against right. people. And I think that's where Harvard made them. Harvard's uh, admissions participants made the mistake, and it's a moral mistake. It's not just a political mistake, of subtracting points or allegedly subtracting points. So doing what you said towards African-Americans, towards Asian-Americans. All right. And, I, and look, again, as I said, I think we can all agree that's wrong <laughs> for a thousand uh, reasons. That's but not it, the issue they're going to right. decide on, though. Exactly. And um, so I think you're right. And those who are able and capable of going to college, um, in this case, will go to community colleges or historically black colleges. Others may not go to college as well. Now, one possible opportunity here is to recognize that the elite universities at least set aside admissions or give positive points for legacy cases, positive points for athletes, et cetera. So I think if there's any sort of silver lining in this discussion, it's uh, seeing how the sausage works. And the sausage works, you know, if your grandfather went to Harvard, you got a much better chance of going to Harvard. That's just a reality. Stanford, et cetera. Um, it's, elite, it's a reality, but it doesn't it make is, me feel good about those schools. I'm sorry. No, oh, no, and I'm not intending it to make you feel good. I'm intending it that the uh, search, you know, scorching light of this decision uh, at least has put some light on um, the various advantage groups, <laughs> right? Um, and without a relative who has gone to the college. And again, that's not the only thing, but it's one thing. So maybe that will change in the algorithm or molecule, or maybe not. And, and as you say, if it doesn't change and we reduce the number of Native Americans and African Americans to Harvard, obviously the legacy cases <laughs> are reduced, right? And it's, it's, a, it's a Malthusian dilemma that continues. Well, you know, it, it strikes me to, to take it to a, a high policy level is these schools are recognized. If, um, you know, a, a young lawyer walks into uh, a law firm and says, I just got out of Harvard or Yale, he's got a tremendous advantage, mm -hmm. or she. Um, and, and that goes across the board. Um, those schools have a special cachet about them. 
Um, so that means that the, the graduates of those schools uh, get into executive uh, high-level positions. They are hired quicker and for better jobs. Um, they define the future of the country in many ways. They, they define the country um, because they, those schools are so respected, at least at this point they are. And, I, and I'm thinking that we really have to have a system uh, where everybody can get into those schools on, a, on an equitable basis, and we have to use those schools to, um, what do you want to call it, to, uh, to, to, to allow the diversity that exists in the country anyway. Nobody gets left behind. No group mm -hmm. gets left behind. They have such power um, for the country, for the future of the country, that we must um, have policy um, that guides them to do the most responsible thing, uh, the most positive thing for the country, especially them, even beyond other schools, because they have so much clout in the marketplace. So to take away affirmative action is to take away that diversity. And it's a tremendous um, loss to higher education, um, not only in those schools, but the schools which will follow this decision, however misguided it may be. Uh, what do you think? I, I think uh, I agree with you entirely. And the record, at least for prominent public universities like Michigan and University of California, which were forced to uh, eliminate affirmative action, both report a considerable drop in the number of applicants among African-Americans and Native Americans, including, remember, they're, they're Native Amer a lot of Native Americans in the Midwest. So I agree with you. Um, I think there are a couple of things we could do to address that. First of all, as I mentioned at the start, the admissions committees will find ways. The private ones will find ways. Um, That's not good law. That's what that is, is bad law uh, and leaving it subjectively up to a bunch of people in the back room. Sorry. I no, I, I, I don't disagree with you. I'm just saying that uh, Harvard and Yale and Stanford and MIT and University of Chicago um, have a lot to gain by ignoring what the court says. So I'm saying they will find they will find ways to reach out and find. Um, I'm more worried about the large uh, public universities, which are either the only opportunity in a state or really of such high quality that for less money, you get a great education. I mean, Berkeley and Michigan, obviously far less than Harvard and Stanford, tremendous. So a lot of what I've been reading is by admissions officers who are worried about the response in public will be among these groups is just to not apply to college. And that, and that you know, they're talking about how difficult it's going to be to reach out, uh, to encourage people to apply for college when they hear about this result, because this, this result cannot really be read by most people other than <laughs> a racial decision. Yeah. You know, even, even, if to, yeah, even if to support a particular group, it's still a racial decision. That's my so, view. It was it, my view from the beginning. Yeah. And so the great fear among, you know, UC recruiters and University of Michigan recruiters and, you know, even say, even say a place like Oklahoma, where there are not a lot of universities. Okay. Um, the other answer is, and this is a, a, an equal seismic shift, is that we really decide we really decide to make public education a top priority, and therefore Harvard still produces what it produces, but people have increasing respect for the non-Harvards, so that the state colleges are better, the community colleges are better, um, and that also makes sense uh, for, if for no other reason than, for example. When Harvard graduates, you know, six PhDs in history, they could fill the entire country <laughs> with their, you know, in their MBA program while among the top only is a certain number. So another- so How uh, do you achieve that equality? How, well, how that, do you uh, raise the other schools up? Money. Money. Yeah. Um, for example, rethink community colleges, which are based on local property taxes, or rethink public high schools that are based on local property taxes. Um, and I've been reading uh, the educational response to this, because I think everybody agrees with you. It's a done deal. As I say, even 5-4, it's a done deal. Okay, it's done. It's over. So the question is, you know, how do you respond? And uh, how do you respond? And the two responses are very different. 
private elite schools will find a way to get those students to their to their classrooms. And maybe inconsistently. Right. Um, I I trust the like Stanford, Chicago, Harvard to find ways to get the Native Americans and African Americans who want to go there that they want to go there. I, I trust that. But I'm worried, as I said, about the public schools or fewer African Americans wanting trying to get into Harvard because of this. All right. So the other strategy is and and it, I mean it's a it's a lot to increase public education, but money matters tremendously. Well, uh, there was a piece recently about um, you know, it's all about uh, there's this uh, college debt issue with uh, Joe Biden and everything, and how you know the colleges have gotten really, really expensive. When I went to the City University in New York, it cost me twelve dollars a semester. That was it. And um, gee whiz, I mean, not, you couldn't do that now in most of the country. Absolutely but not. Even in in government schools, you know, in state and and uh, uh, you know state schools, it's twelve dollars to park. <laughs> yeah, one yeah. day, one moment, yeah. one hour. Right. Uh, so, so the the problem is, uh, it's it's gotten very, very expensive to run higher education. I don't know why. You must know why that has happened over the right. past few decades. That's another. That's a, we could have a, a long discussion about but that. If, but if you say it's right. money, money, uh, and you say you, you know, let's pour money into the non Ivy League, uh, you're talking about. Uh, a lot of money because schools, higher education has gotten so expensive. Right. And that, and we it would be good to have a discussion about the role of colleges. So when I say money, I don't, I don't mean simply pouring it down the tube. But uh, for example, I think uh, President Obama's idea about free community college education makes plenty of sense. Community colleges are really, uh, to paraphrase the states' rights people, they're laboratories. There are people who work full time who go there. There are older people. There are younger people. There are people getting practical degrees like nursing. They are a, a wonderful laboratory, um, and the professors there are generally devoted to teaching. That's the goal of community college. And I could see, as part of the process, right, reaching out, getting these underrepresented groups into community colleges giving them those two years free. And if they do well, like many states, you can matriculate to the local large public university. So UCLA, for example- well, That ought to be a very easy path because at the end of the day, we want these minority groups to be in charge of American industry, in charge of American government, industry, all our institutions. We want them to be diverse and we want them to be everywhere. And they're not going to be everywhere out of a two-year college unless we make a path to get them to Harvard and Yale and the Ivy League where they can get the, the best possible jobs in that community. Well, also, I mean, if they, if they go to UCLA or Berkeley or University of Illinois or University of Michigan, they'll also get excellent jobs. So I agree with you. We can't, you know, the, the goal is not to stop at two years unless it's appropriate, right? If an individual would like to be a nurse and can get a two-year degree in practice nursing, great. You know, and the opportunity to go to the other two years could be held out for the future. Um, but I think inadvertently, maybe you've struck at the two problems, and maybe this is a way for us to, <laughs> to finish up. Okay. People, many people argue against the idea of reparations, right? You know, it's not my problem. You know, my family immigrated in the 1930s, so I'm not responsible for this. That's not an unheard of response. Again, it is in the public interest the way you describe it, and I think of, you know, and probably 49.5% think of, is it, in order to get to where we want to as a country, we have to redress what we've done. I mean, we rebuilt Japan, right? We rebuilt Germany. <laughs> I don't understand we, why we can't rebuild America. Okay, but you've struck at the fact that e that the reparations argument is not one everybody will embrace. And secondly, I, I think with the um, review at the Supreme Court, which lasted between five and six hours, it was a long time, and all the journalists were. I mean, usually it's an you know two three at most. Uh, we also found that not everybody agrees with the idea of diversity. So when you say, for example, the country would be better. If the uh, board of General Motors, as well as the workplace, as well as the stores sending, selling General Motors goods, 
we're all as diverse as possible. Again, not everybody agrees with that. And that rubs, the two rub up against, you know, the white nationalist replacement theory, right? I remember years ago when salsa replaced ketchup as, as the item to be dumped on everything that had no taste. At the cafeteria, people were in an uproar, right? Somehow America has lost its soul, et cetera. Uh, and I don't, I, that sounds trite. The example is trite, but the message is not. So I think a lot is at stake here. And equally with the abortion issue, because the abortion is, is about women's ability to participate fully in society, right? So if you uh, prevent contraception and if you demand the birth of a child, uh, you know, you're, you're sidelining uh, you're 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 that woman from no, society. And that's less diverse. So fewer women around the boardroom, fewer women. And I think at the top, I think what we're really talking about to a great degree is uh, the top will probably diversify. I'm worried about the middle because that's where state colleges help people really get a leg up. I mean, the number of people going to Harvard is limited, right? But the number of people potentially walking through, even here, University of Hawaii, I mean, the, the poorer kids who I might have a chance to do something. Yeah, and the, and the middle is where those kids you were talking about um, will say, I'm not going to apply. Yeah, the, those yeah. in the very poor will just not apply. Uh, that's absolutely right. I, it, it's a devastating. And also, you know, women will have, if, if things go through the way the court wants to, uh, the trajectory of an individual woman's life. Again, the wealthiest will find a way, right? That's so, why. So, yeah, that's really my question to you here is uh, they're going to strike affirmative action. We know that now. Um, it's a matter of weeks or maybe a couple months, but it mm -hmm. won't be long. And, th and then it's going to be over. It's going to be over for Harvard and in North Carolina, what have you. Right. Uh, and on all the schools that might have, might have well, rest of the North, the North Carolina argument and the Harvard argument are not just about the institutions. You know, as a lawyer, any institution that gets federal funding. Right. That that's the wave they're surfing oh, on. So that's a lot of institutions. Oh, you know, every 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 institution gets. So every what, what effect on education? What effect on the body of students? What effect on the um, the management of the country? What what effect on the level of intellectual acuity? The level of um, the, the level of creativity? Uh, the level of you know thoughtful participation in government. Uh, what effect will the, all of that have? It'll have the effect that we're all worried about, an increasingly divided society. The best and the brightest, quote unquote, will get their opportunities. And the rest of us <laughs> in the middle and below will find our opportunities more segregated and more limited. So as I said near the beginning, I, I mean, I think that historically black colleges will pick up admissions. Um, and those have, a, have and continue to have a very important role, but it now will change, right? It used to be a, it used to be a role where African-Americans could not go anywhere else, <laughs> all right? Then it was a role that they coexisted, and now, in a way, it's more to the plus E.V. Ferguson role, right? If you're a young kid um, and you have a chance to go there and you know that University of Georgia is not going to include race or cannot include race, so, you know, like all public policy decisions, there are always some beneficiaries, but it just comes at a cost. So the cost is African-American kids getting a good education at those schools, but a segregated education. What about the, what about the state of Hawaii? What about UH? So I don't, to be honest, I don't know much about admissions, if anything, um, but UH would have, if, if UH includes race or ethnicity, they would have to scratch it from uh, their admissions policy. To be honest with you, I, I have no idea. I, I assume- I assume don't have an idea because, because we don't think of race. We really right. are racially blind, which I, is I mean, to I don't our know, I don't know if, um, you know, for example, uh, there are relatively, relatively few African-Americans in Hawaii and relatively few on campus. I don't know if some of the recruiters maybe go out, et cetera, but certainly um, I would think it wouldn't serve anybody's purpose in the Hawaiian community. There were, and except, except very importantly, um, if you allow race and ethnicity, you can have special programs for Native Hawaiians. Those are essential, 
absolutely essential. Uh, Waimanalo, uh, Kahuku, go out to Waianae. I, and those are probably in some way or another uh, determined by race or ethnicity. And those have been win, win, win situations. All right. Uh, there are far more uh, native Hawaiians or people of mixed uh, hapa than there were in the old days, right? Used to be sort of athletes, but now, uh, so th that does worry me. I mean, now you've got me worried. One more reason not to sleep at night. Um, <laughs> and there are so yeah. many of them these days. But oh, you could my, you could make an argument. But you could make an argument, um, like you could with Native Americans. You could make a political argument, right? The Native Americans are a tribe, and it's not the Native American in them that is underrepresented. It's the tribe that's underrepresented. I mean, you could kind of waffle around it politically. And I think probably we could find something here uh, to avoid the far right, something about, um, you could even use the category indigenous, which is not a racial category. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think if we thought about it, you know, we could find a way, uh, personally, after being here for 30 years, uh, I'll use a little Yiddish, it would be a Shonda. It would be a Shonda if any effort is made to limit um, outreach, because it does take outreach, it does take encouragement, right? To go to Waianae, where kids don't really think about going to college necessarily, to go out there and recruit. And for our state, it's essential. I mean, to, to try to heal the wounds, to try to address reparations, for all the good reasons, diversity, et cetera. So I would hope, and I'm sure people are thinking about this because they, they agree with you that the ax is going to fall. We'll find some way, um, if not intent, the effect will be multiracial, right? If not the, if not the, the uh, you know, the de jure expression of it. And I could see finding a different kind of language. I could see finding a political language. Yeah, uh, well, maybe this will wake uh, Hawaii up in some ways and other states, you know, um, to, to find a way and uh, to reject the notion of uh, what the Supreme Court is likely well, to I think do. We'll I think we'll reject it here. We have. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the, the, I mean the, to actually go further than that. Yeah, I, the more outreach, you know? Yeah, I think our most difficult issue as far as the Supreme Court is going to be guns. That's yeah. another show. Yeah, because the number of applications for uh, carry have just skyrocketed. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Ridiculous, I, you know? But I think ab abortion we will protect. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no way we're going to deny same-sex marriage. That's part of Hawaiian law. It's part of Hawaiian history, even. Um, multiple identities, you know, in traditional. Now, Congress, Congress, in the, in the uh, next few weeks, Congress may, um, you know, uh, come up with something on same-sex marriage. And in the last few we'll weeks. We're trying to. The Senate will pass yeah, it. But yeah. um, McCarthy will have, well, he could have a majority of up to nine or, up to nine or ten. So I'm yeah, not we'll sure it's going to see what yeah. happens. Yeah, right. I take away from this show the uh, the appropriate use of the word Shonda. I think everybody okay. should write that down. <laughs> and right. I think you should put that on, on the final exam. Okay. And uh, <laughs> last our last show, we talked about marmalade. Uh, and this show, we talked about salsa. So okay. It's all about, you know, getting food. ready for about Thanksgiving food. Food, food. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Peter Hoffenberg, history take professor at UH. Take care. Talk to you. Enjoy all the holidays. Okay. <laughs> Same. All right, bye-bye. Aloha. Bye -bye. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.